Welcome to the Ray Harryhausen Podcast, the show dedicated to the life, career and films of a special effects titan. Join us as we host in-depth discussions about the work, influences and legacy of this uniquely talented filmmaker. Brought to you by the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation, we will be delving into Ray's archive to bring a unique insight into his work, including exclusive audio from the man himself from our own archives. We will be joined by special guests for retrospectives, exclusive announcements and competitions. So this podcast is a must-listen for all fans of the world of Ray Harryhausen, animation and classic filmmaking. Hello and welcome to episode 25 of the Ray Harryhausen podcast. And it's a special edition today. And I often say it's a special podcast, but today it really is because uh, uh, I'm joined by our collections manager, Connor Heaney who's done a very special interview, haven't you, Connor? That's right. I was lucky enough to, to meet up with Harryhausen star Kurt Christian at his home in, in West Hollywood. And for those of you who, who maybe don't remember Kurt's name, he was a starring actor in two of Ray's classic films from the 1970s, The Golden Voyage of Sinbad in 1973 and Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger in 1977. So two films in a row. And uh, he had a huge contribution to some of some of Ray's most beloved pictures uh, fr- from that era. So it was it was really fantastic to speak to Kurt, and we're going to hear a very enjoyable interview with with Kurt today. So Connor, you recorded this in America because you were over for a uh, for a special awards ceremony, and you were with Vanessa Harryhausen and Caroline Monroe's daughter Tammy Hamalian. That's right. Ray Harryhausen was inducted into the Visual Effects Society. Hall of Fame in October 2018 and Vanessa was invited uh, over to Los Angeles to accept the certificate and this award on her father's behalf. Uh, So a lovely event and uh, a a great thing for for us to be able to attend and whilst we were in Los Angeles we caught up with with various contacts with people who who knew Ray or who had worked with Ray and uh, of course one of the people we'd been wanting to speak to for a long time was Kurt Christian. Uh, we'd, I'd been in touch with him uh, through social media, the wonderful Facebook, and uh, and then through email. And he'd, you know, he'd said he'd be interested in, in chatting at some point, and we just thought this was the perfect opportunity. Uh, for a bit of context, he'd actually met Vanessa before because she was on the set of Golden Voyage and Eye of the Tiger. So he met her when she was a, a very young girl. She was still a child. Uh, but she has very fond memories of, of uh, you know, what a lovely man he was. He was a really nice, uh, really kind person, as you'll hear from the interview. And, and she has very happy memories of meeting with him. So there was this lovely opportunity to meet up with Kurt uh, for Vanessa to be reintroduced to him. And it was great to have Tammy there too, because, of course, Tammy's, uh, Tammy's mother, Caroline, was was a co-star in, in one of Kurt's films. She is also somebody that he has very happy memories of. So it was a nice little reunion, and you'll hear uh, you'll hear various voices uh, during our interview because everybody was chipping and everyone was having a lovely time, you know, reminiscing about about the good old days of of, of these Ray Harryhausen classics being being put together and what it was like for Kurt as an actor. And of course, you kicked off by asking him the uh, the story behind the stunts in the Golden Voyage of Sinbad. That's right. I want to get right back to the beginning and ask him his his thoughts on, on being a young actor and working working on the Golden Voyage. So so let's hear from Kurt himself. Here's Kurt Christian talking about the Golden Voyage of Sinbad. <laughs> then be warned, we can afford no laggards on this voyage. Every man must carry his own weight and more. There's water down there. There's water everywhere. We're at sea. This boy's a genius. Oh. Oh. Remember my father's shot? My father coming up? Father! This was his idea, wasn't it? A quick run round the harbor to sober up. Clear the cobwebs away. All right. The sea breeze is beautiful. Cobwebs are all gone. Now we can go home. Sorry. We're on course now. You're with us all the way. All the way. Oh well, I suppose things could be worse. A couple of days away from home isn't too bad. A couple of weeks? A month? More than a month? Or two, three years, perhaps. Two or three years? But I'll be an old man by then. I'll be ancient. Just show me to my cabin so I can lie down. 
No cabin. No lying down. You bunk with the men. You want to eat? You work. Work? Work? This is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> On the, sin, the first Sinbad, we had um, a wonderful guy called Fernando Poggi, who was a stuntman, yeah. and, and he had been an Olympic fencer mm -hmm. and taught us all how to fence. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he couldn't, I think it was the second one where he, he couldn't be there at the beginning of it. And so, oh no, no, it was, sin, it was the first Simba. I'm sorry, Golden Voyage. Golden Voyage. Um, so they had the world champion Sabre guy, a big Russian guy, Bulgarian guy, six foot eight. And he was the current world Sabre champion. And he was supposed to teach us until Fernando arrived. And he, he was so competitive and a giant on top of it, that he would whack us. Oh. Hit us on the head, pound like that. You know, oh my like, God. You know it's a movie. You know? yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like that. And you go, too slow. <laughs> like oh, oh my Lord, like a cruel teacher. <laughs> and we finally complained <laughs> to Charlie, you know, and he had to tone, they had toned him down and said, oh. no, 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 because everybody was walking around. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh. And all cut up and oh. banged up. You know? And if he was showing you something, uh -huh. he would hit you. He would, he would hit you as hard as possible. Oh, my gosh. And uh, later he had to do a, a scene with John Philip Law where he, he fought him, and he could not understand the concept of losing to, to, <laughs> to the hero of the movie. He said, you know, movies may not be the best thing for you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, that's interesting. And once I was playing chess with him on the set, waiting, and I made a move and, and he put him in check, and he was Bulgarian, and he said, you can't do that move. <laughs> he took it back, and I said, no, that's Czech, you know. And, yeah. and he just could not lose, whatever it was, you know. It was... So you were relieved when Paul G eventually did arrive. And, oh, you know, a reasonable and he was, stunt. Yes, <laughs> and he, he was a very good choreographer, and he'd work out these things you know, beautifully for the camera, you know, and, for, and to keep everybody as safe as possible. Well, he worked with Ray in so many films, all the way right, right the way back to Jason yes. and the Argonauts. He was actually one of the Argonauts as yeah. an extra, so he he had a good idea of what Very kind good. of action was needed. In and uh, there was another guy called Aldo Sambrell. He was in the, the first one too, and they had both they were both Italian. They'd both been in spaghetti westerns, muscle man movies, and they had been different sizes. For doing long and lean for yeah. cowboy movies, and and then uh, then went on to be stunt uh, coordinators. Yeah. Great, great people. Well, can we go back to the very beginning? So the right. first of Ray's films that you were in was the Golden Voyage of Simba, right. which is an all-time classic. Love it's, it. It's yeah. a fan favorite. People really enjoy that film, and it, for the nineteen seventies, it's, it's a real highlight. Oh. How did it come about? How, how how did you end up being cast? as a Harun in, in The Golden Voyage. It was uh, really quick. It was like a one-off thing. I had a big head of hair, like it was thick and black. <laughs> and uh. <laughs> I was very physical, and I, I was just come from the National Theatre, so I was full of beans and confidence, you know, and uh, auditioned for them, and boom, that was, I think, the next day. So it, was, it was the simplest thing I've ever been through. Yeah. And the, in that film, you're obviously a, a light-hearted character. Yes, it's, it's, it's you know, it's one yes. of, yeah, you provide some some relief. Right, and he film. becomes a hero. At yeah, the end, and, and, and that's what I love. And I get to be in every single fight, including yeah. pushing Carly off, off the, the off thing, the thing. Yeah. And then Martin Shaw, who's a big star in England, he's yeah. he's uh, George Gently in the yes. wonderful show. Uh, he was he was my buddy, and we were in, lived in the same building. Yeah. Uh, in Madrid while we were shooting. And he was a vegan then, 40 years ago, you know. He was ahead uh, of his time. Yes, way really ahead of his time. Yeah, yeah. So and he was a great guy, a terrific actor. Uh, and all of the, the characters were all played by top-notch people. Douglas Wilmer was, a, was his Sherlock Holmes. He, mm. was, he was wonderful. And uh, we, right away, the first thing we did was in the grottos. Do you, do you remember this? All lit up, 
and Caroline and I and uh, John, John Philippe Law was a great guy. And uh, uh, we had to do these grueling scenes for like 10 days because uh, it was only open at night. During the day it was tourists. You know? So we shot at night and it was lit up beautifully. Uh, but it was if you if you went to the left, if I went as far as there, that's it. You didn't know where you were. <laughs> it was black, <laughs> and there were bats. And, yeah, you know. now I always talked about the bats. Yes, yeah, like hundreds of you'd, bats. Yeah, hundreds. Of, yeah, you'd look up sometimes and yes. go, "Oh my God, those are moving." Right. <laughs> Some of those scenes specifically were amongst the most complex that Ray ever designed. That's true. Did, by his own admission, he said. Why do I make life so difficult for myself? Because there was so much going on, and it must yeah. be difficult for for all of you as actors. And the most amazing thing was was when when everything comes down. I mean, it's supposed to be, and I've forgotten if it was an explosion or, but 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 it looked like the real thing was coming down when we shot it. It was pretty terrifying. And then I had the I had to shoot the homunculus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I had to do a little bit of archery with, with Fernando, and uh, that was really fun. Uh, and uh, and all, everybody there, they, they got this great lady to come in and from the Spanish theater from Madrid, you know, a very dignified lady, and she was a mad witch. Do you, do you remember on the... Um, she was the one that prophesied this, yes. and, you know, and she, she just, she just went all the way with it. It was great. And she was great. And then Robert Shaw, he literally... Um, came by the studio and did, did two days quickly. And do you have many memories of Robert Shaw? Because it's something that even a lot of Ray's fans don't uh, realise, that it's legendary actor Robert Shaw under all of that makeup and just as a, almost a cameo role. As, well, as just he was, he was a delightful guy and a huge personality and he had eight kids and that's why he came to do it cash. You know, <laughs> come and do it and go on. <laughs> and he was really fun. I mean, he was full of life. But they shot it very quickly. I think over a weekend or over three days, maybe. Very cool. but the, and all the makeup was very intrusive for oh him as well. It was quite difficult. Very difficult. The teeth and everything were, yeah. were quite difficult for him. And, and where we shot, it was outside of Madrid. With, there's a ship in the middle of the <laughs> desert, literally. We shot everything on that ship. And even uh, fantastic storms. Yeah. Oh, it was amazing. Mi- and that was done old fashioned way yeah. that they did it here with huge barrels of water. Wow! And they knocked you flat. You know. It was really, uh, it got hairy sometimes, but it was fun. It was delightful. Well, we want to talk a little more about your fellow cast members because, as you said, The Golden Voyage had, had one of Ray Harryhausen's greatest ever casts. Absolutely. Everyone that was involved. And uh, we have to mention Caroline Monroe, who's oh. Tammy's mum, and who, I don't know if you know, in later life became involved with, with Ray's foundation. She, she was a trustee with the Ray and that. I no idea, we talk, no. She's still involved in, in promoting the, the collection and Ray's work and, and the legacy. So oh. she, she stayed friends with, with Ray for, for the rest of, of his life and is still friends with, with all of us here. Right. Um, and she was a Bond girl. She yes. Oh, and she had an incredible career, obviously, yeah. Yes. Rowan, what, what are your memories of working? Well, with she, the first thing, she, when she walked into a room, every all the men went quiet. <laughs> That's how it wasn't a, like a, you know, it was like <laughs> she was breathtaking. I mean, and you just could, and nobody had seen a figure like that mm-hmm. with a waist like that going into hips, and just the whole shape was just glorious, you know. And her then her demeanor changed everything and made you. You know, everybody fell in love with her in in a, in a non prurient way. You know, <laughs> and then and um, and we would, did loads of scenes together. So so we, she was so charming, and we had all these long talks. And because you have to keep each other up, you know, and ebullient for the next scene. You know, so we were giggling and laughing, and half of the time it was laughing and having an absolute ball mm-hmm. on both movies. And and on that one. She was a big part of it, uh, of, of keeping everybody's spirits up. And one, I have to tell you, one of the funniest scenes in the movie is the, when the green men come oh, <laughs> And that, that would make you cry with laughter, the things that went on, because they were all Broadway dancers that lived in Europe, because they weren't quite good enough to be in Broadway, on Broadway. And they were all... They all were the same size and the same shape, 
And they were so excited to be shooting something and, and, and dancing around and moving around. And it was a big scene in that, in a very yeah, big, uh, yeah, big, yeah. yeah. And um, that they went nuts. <laughs> in what way? In the, I mean, they... They just, everything was, as soon as they went action, they went, ah, 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 and they were screaming and shouting. They were lifting us up, your, your, your mom yeah. and I were both lifted up in the right, air to take right. and run. And then, <laughs> so not much direction needed. No. Action, no. And they went. Right, 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 right. And they yeah. went, and they went, they were, they were so enthusiastic and they were, and they, and then in between they were doing, they were dancing and yeah. jumping up and down. Yeah. And that and is this. a great scene though. And, it, and we were yeah. genuinely frightened because there were so many of them and it was so <laughs> insane. It was like, you could feel them bobbling you up and down. I remember when, one of the, when they had a break, one of the green men came out with a guy with the skull mm -hmm. and he came out and he just gave, I just about shot up to the ceiling and he said, no, 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 don't cry, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's okay then. So he deliberately yeah, did it? Oh, yeah, that's yeah, funny. That's funny. funny. Yeah. Get a and shot. you were so young. I know. Oh man, you were all. But I think my face looked like I was going to cry. And he's like, no, 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 just <laughs> cry. I was, like, ah, I was just frightened, you know. Exactly. They were yeah. so excited. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was great. That was a very, very funny scene. <laughs> then, um, and so we were, we were good friends. And then John was a very nice man. He was a chiropractor. Oh. At some, uh, earlier on in his life, and uh, and so every now and then when you had something wrong from all the action, he'd go and he'd fix it for you. And he told me he was six foot six, but he could only put six foot four on the on resumes because nobody would employ him otherwise they think he, he was a monster, you know. <laughs> He was a great Simbad as well because there was a he sort was. Of roguish, slightly more yeah, roguish. He's got dignity, yeah. but he's still roguish. You know, um, the yeah. earlier Simbad, Carolyn Matthews, had been more of a, you know, more of your, your um, typical good guy. Yes. Whereas, uh, yes. John Philip Law had a glint in his eye. No, he did, and yeah. he had he had worked on some big movies. Mm -hmm. Russians are coming, and uh, and uh, Barbarella. Right. Right. You know, so he had a lot of experience, and he really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. That's great, and. Uh, Tom Baker as well. So Tom Baker was a very show. eccentric man in, in real life. And, uh, and you, you never knew quite. He had that kind of charisma, kind of like Harrison Ford, where you don't know if he's going to kiss you or punch you in the face. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know he's, he's looking at you and you're not sure if he, if he likes you or not. Doesn't like. and, but then he'd go on, a, he did these, um, not rants, but, but he'd talk about some special thing like the Beatles or something and... It would go on for 20 minutes, you know, and his sonorous voice, and, you know, and he, and then there was, um, his assistant was Takis, a Greek actor, who was like the handsomest man that ever lived, you know, and he, he, he just kept posing, you know, <laughs> and he only had, a, he was a, his assistant, but, it, but everything about him was like an old-fashioned uh, 30s leading man, you know, he had that presence, you know. And he made sure that they knew it. Because <laughs> Tom had all the action, you know. So. And poor old Douglas Wilmer as well, oh. also with that mask. That looked like such it was an ordeal hell. to wear that. It was a kind of a plastic or a rubbery Inside thing. it was. It's, it's sort of like a... Yes. Oh, we still have, we still have yeah, the, oh uh, my the God. mask in our really? Okay. Yeah, we have and everything. He would take that off this second <laughs> that they'd say cut. Well, I've looked into this, this helmet mask that he wore and gone, how can a human head fit in that for, for hours and hours of, on, on set it's or true. On, on location? It's true. Um, and he wasn't a young man at that time. And he had this young wife. <laughs> she was a gorgeous woman. Uh, she was about 30. And he was about 50-ish, something like that. And they were uh, very, very close. And, uh, and she was... She was very sweet with him. She'd make, mock him, mock his brow, make sure he was okay. And he was charming and very, very witty. And so that bring, made everybody else sharper, and, and the wit would go back and forth. Now, we've spoken a lot about the cast, but of course the, the main man for, for the Sinbad films was Ray Harryhausen himself. And you were involved in a lot of the sequences with Ray's animation, um, do you have any particular? Maybe I mean you you mentioned the homunculus, you yes, the figurehead sequence, the cow, well, he, and so many more. He would explain to you in detail exactly what was going on, which 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 the actors love because they. 
they've got something to hang on to, you know. And and then they had these eye lines, kind of like Kali was eight foot tall, and he he'd have this cutout that you could look at, and you you, you got a whole perspective on it of how big it was. You know, it was so taller than that, and you'd be looking up, and you'd know how to put, how to do your saber work and everything. And he would, and he was so encouraging when you'd when you'd get it. You know, and then he'd say, "Yes, that's exactly what." Oh, you know, okay. and he was so de- he was just delightful, and the most unobtrusive person. He, was, he reminded me of the way Clint Eastwood directs, which is he didn't even say action. You know, it was like, "Okay, and now," you know, <laughs> like oh, wow. that kind of thing. You know, wow. that kind of atmosphere. So he had a very wonderful atmosphere on the set, and the, I think Gordon Hessler was the director, and he was like a TV and TV director and. Uh, very sweet man, very bright, and very s- similar to Ray in the, in the um, quietness and, uh-huh. the, and the, the consideration and everything. So they they were very good together. But Sam Wanamaker in the second one was a whole different <laughs> kettle of fish. You know, he was this dynamic ex method actor who was who was uh, un American activities guy. So he lived in England because he couldn't work in America for a long time because of McCarthy and all that nonsense. And uh, so he was a big intellect, you know, and he would he would try to bring that part of it <laughs> in the second, and people would be looking at him, you know, all these. <laughs> mm, really? Okay. <laughs> well, Sam Wanamaker would later go on to work with the, uh, Shakespeare's Globe Theatre and yes. London and so many other. Oh stuff. my God! He's the behind that, mm. behind that whole thing. Yeah, so and he had, he had worked with all the the greatest uh, in the fifties and sixties. Your courage has deserted you. Me? No. My heart is full of bravery. But I have very cowardly legs. It's marvellous, isn't it? And I think from a producer's point of view, Kurt is the perfect actor because not only is he a very nice person and he gives no trouble, you know, he's low maintenance, but he gives a remarkable performance because it was... Um, it's not obvious to Harry Harryhausen fans that he appeared in two films because he's so versatile. His demeanour also changed his look and, and the sort of the atmosphere he brought around his character. So I think he's, he's, he's one of the really standout performances, not only in Golden Voyage of Sinbad, but in Eye of the Tiger that you're going to be talking about next. And from the sound of it, Connor, he really remembered and relished the memories that, um, that, if you like, your regression therapy brought up by chatting in, in that group session. That's right. I mean, I was uh, firing questions at him about his co-stars and about working with Ray and all of the creatures that uh, that he encounters in the in the two movies he starred in. So um, I was I was delighted with how clear and how sharp his memories were of everything that happened, about all the wonderful people that he got to work with, and then about the, the creatures that he eventually saw on the big screen. And I think a, a huge part of that is just how much fun he had on the set and how much fun he had working with Ray. It seems like a really happy time in his life and uh, it was a joy. His enthusiasm to this day is, is, is really remarkable. I think it's a testament to, to how beloved these films are. It is. And uh, just at the end there, you, you, um, you were about to chat about the next Sinbad film, uh, Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger, as directed by Sam Wanamaker. And interestingly, Sam Wanamaker, as, as I think you touched upon in that segment, um, had been uh, blacklisted as part of the McCarthyism hearings that took place in the sort of the 40s and 50s in, in America. And, and just for our, our younger listeners who, who are not quite sure what happened there, it was a series of, of, of governmental hearings, a series of, if you like, public inquiries that was headed up by a Republican politician, Joseph McCarthy, who was a senator from uh, Wisconsin. And it was his view that because Hollywood, particularly for the, the film side of Hollywood, the cinema side of Hollywood, was so influential, most Americans would go to the cinema once or twice a week, that they had a responsibility to not only deliver, if you like, the the message from the West and from the democracy that is America, but also to provide a moral compass. So films that maybe showed too much leg or films that suggested promiscuity, those filmmakers might have been targeted. But in particular, people who were politically on the left, that, that call themselves communists or Marxists, were, were um, if you like, called out on that and asked to either, 
relinquish membership of the party or to step away from from the creative process. Now, many filmmakers resented being involved in the hearings. Many refused to name other people who may or may not have been Communist Party members. But the interesting thing about the blacklist, and it's had a lot of attention, is that when people went onto the list, they never actually came off the list because... It was in, in later years, the whole process was, was largely uh, discredited. But uh, people haven't been really exonerated or pardoned in the way perhaps one might be pardoned in this country if you'd been convicted of something that you were later found to be innocent of. Um, but interestingly, Sam Wanamaker went on to have a spectacularly successful career. He started as an actor and he worked as a, as a, a producer and director later on and was responsible for restoring, restoring the Globe Theatre in London. Um, so quite a, uh, a prestigious person to helm the film, not necessarily the right director for the project, but um, it was uh, an interesting fit, Connor, and uh, Kirk Christian had some interesting memories, didn't he, of working with Sam? Yes, that's right, and uh, as with everything that, that Kurt spoke about, he was very very positive about working with, with Sam Wanamaker. Um, yeah, let's let's hear what, what he thought about the film's director and about... The, the setup for Eye of the Tiger in general. O oh, brave and proud bull whose mighty heart my son has fashioned of purest gold. Beat with the power as only I command him. I made it perfect in every detail. O oh, mighty Abu Salem, you who rule over a thousand devils. By all the fires of hell and darkness, give strength and life to this your creature, Minaton. Minaton. Perfect. A colossus of bronze and the mind to command. Well, that brings us nicely into the Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger because right. it, it's quite unusual. I mean, there were a few actors that were in more than one of Ray's films, but right. for somebody to appear in two of Ray's films in a row, in a similar kind of role... Well, and, actually, and the, 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 the roles are opposing. Yes, yeah, but... The one is a hero the, and, yeah. a, and, a, and, a, a, and it starts off as a drunk who needs to be put into shape and, and woken up, you know, and, uh, and then becomes a hero. And then the other guy is just so jealous and full of hate and, and wants to be the man. You know. And how did that come about for you to, to appear in a second, the second Ray Harryhausen film in a row? Apparently, um, Charles told me that, uh, that they had written that part and thought immediately of me. Either they wrote it for me or they, they said, oh yeah, we, we know the guy who can do that. And... Um, and then that was then I had a black beard and I, had, I was completely different, you know, and it was so great, you know. And I, and that then I was the creator of these monsters, the heart. This is a great scene in it with uh, Margaret and I with the heart, and and when we've we've made him and he's all ready, you know, to get that. It was really really exciting, that that scene. You know, we just got carried away with it. It was great. And it is fun for you to almost like Yin and Yang. You're playing this nice. Yes. Gentle chap in the first. Yes. And then in the, in the Silly second kind film, of guy that's always yeah, making yeah. mistakes. And, you're, and, the, yeah. you're the villain, and you're the, the lead villain is uh, Prince Rafi. And yes. Marvelous. Son. What are you and the clothes, the, the, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, the, it was all silk, and it was, it was magnificent. And uh, you, just, you, you know, Olivier, I worked for Olivier, and he used to say, as soon as you've got the costume on, dear boy, you'll, it'll be fine. You know, <laughs> and it's true. You put these costumes on, and your your posture changes, and you you start moving in a different way. You know? And we started that one with a a scene in the oldest uh, the oldest synagogue in Europe, and uh, and we shot that opening scene. And that's a great opener with yourself and great Margaret, opener. Margaret Whiting glancing at each other across the yes. room. And and, and she was conspiracy. dynamic, you know. She was a very exciting person to work well, what with. What are your memories of Margaret Whiting? Oh, she's she, a great villainess in, oh, in the film. She, we cried with laughter all day long. That's it. that's the way we worked together. <laughs> and then the moment that it was action, we would just, we just, it just became it was great, you know, because she was superb. 
and she didn't mind going all the way with it, you know, and just giving it everything, you know. But she she could keep still, which was which was a very strong effect. You know. She was so much fun, and her husband came, who was a famous uh, actor in uh, in the theater as well, and uh, they had twins. And, and uh, she was to see her being the witch, and then to see her being mummy. You know, it was so hilarious. You know? Well, you've spoken about the iconic sequence of you building the Minotaur yes. and putting the heart. In, and again, in our archive, we still have Minotaur's heart. Oh. We still have like, some of it's these. It's so things. intricate and beautiful. You can look it's at it. It's wonderful. From, I think mm. Colin Arthur built all of these. Uh, That's smaller right. Props. He was incredible. He he. Later, I worked with him on another movie, and he made me some fangs. Uh, for fun, and it was in Austria, and they still believe in vampires. And so I would go out at night and with long, thick black hair, and and dressed all in black, and I, and I'd go to discotheques to pick up girls and meet girls, <laughs> and then I occasionally I'd go <laughs> like that, and they they would. <laughs> it, was, it was great. So he was a great creator because he because they were really terrifying. Well, he worked quite closely with Ray on a number of his yes. pictures, and it was great to have him. Was he an his, artist originally? He's a, a makeup artist. He worked on 2001. That's Space right. Odyssey, and then Conan the Barbarian and various oh, other films. legendary stuff. But, yeah, he's a... a, a he was so much... Artist. He was a funny guy, too. A lot of fun. That's, and that's Go on. Uh, well, I want to mention Minotaur because yes. they were building the Minotaur. And Minotaur's a rare character amongst Ray Harryhausen's menagerie because he was a stop-motion latex figure, but he was also played by an actor in a fiberglass costume for, for long shots. And some people may not be aware that that actor was Peter Mayhew, right. who went on to become Chewbacca, based on, on Simba and the Eye of the Tiger. He was, he was headhunted for his, his role as Minotaur. Yeah, he was a, a, a fascinating character in real life because he was very, very nice and... His, but he were fascinated by him all the time because of his size. He was just was a, he was so outlandish, and um, and for him to be that gentle and that fun, you know. But he and his feet were gigantic, and you couldn't you you, you couldn't stop looking at them. <laughs> but he was very sweet, and we paid we we spent a lot of time. Margaret and I spent a lot of time with him, and um, and then he'd have days off, but he would come to the set. You know, and everybody loved him. He was just a, an adorable guy. Because that was his first film. He'd been yes. as a hospital. He'd been a hospital reporter. He'd been in the newspapers for being a, a large man, and and that's where Charles Schneider saw him. I went, that's yes. He's just but another uncomfortable costume as well. Fiberglass. Difficult. Minotaur. And he hardly ever complained at all. You know, and um, and and a lot of it was was on the ship, and we were out to sea, uh, not very far out, but but um, it was a really weird setup. There was a kind of a, a, a boat inside a boat, you know, moving it along, you know, with the outboard motors and things, but, but the outside was this, was this uh, beautiful shape, you know, of, of an ancient boat. That was boat. in Malta, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, because I was there on the set when they did all the, the um, scenes for the um, walrus and everything. Oh my God, that's yeah. right, that's right. And then we, we all had and, and fur had coats on and it was 100 degrees. It was a hundred degrees, yeah. you know? and Jane and all, and uh, Taryn and all, <laughs> all, all of us. The moment they said cut, we throw these things off, and everybody had just underpants on and <laughs> or a bikini, or you know, because <laughs> you gave up your costume after a while and just put the big coat on. But it's a convincing effect. It looks like it's oh, been filmed in the God, Arctic, it's too... and, uh, you can't believe it's in the baking heat of Malta. Yeah, it, was, it literally was ninety to hundred degrees. You know? And then when you, you looked with dread at these fur coats, you know. And it was an action scene, so it was just like, wow. Now, Vanessa's just mentioning some of her memories here. Do you remember Vanessa? Very, well, very well. Set, Ray's daughter, obviously, in both films. We used to chat all the time. I don't know if you remember, but um, but um, I love children. So uh, so even when I was a kid, I liked children. <laughs> and, um, and, and you were always right next to him. Right next to Ray, oh. you know, and you were, you were like right next to him there, and oh. and he was always showing you things, and the, the interaction was beautiful. 
And it was a lot of fun, and I liked make, telling you stories or making you giggle and laugh. And so. Well, I remember um, in, when it was lunchtime, we had lunch in a big hangar. Yes. And all the crew and the actors and everybody sat. Yes. And, and you sat next to me, and I, I think, I can't remember who sat That's there, next to me, Patrick or something. Yes. Sat, yeah. yeah. And you had no bread rolls, and I had a bread roll, so I said, hey, you can have my bread roll. And you said, oh, that's so kind of you. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that was, uh, that's so great. wonderful that you won't be giving you <laughs> so well, You're so weak. Oh, you know? absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and you were so kind. You were so patient. Everyone was so nice. Hopefully they were. An annoying child. They were. Do you remember our villa? It's, yeah. it's a walled city. St. Teresa is supposed to have been there. And it, they, there's these 20 foot walls and big, thick walls. And. Um, we were outside, and that was supposed to be when, when uh, Patrick, uh, I'm the, I'm a prince, uh, I'm Prince Rafi, and I bring him in, and it's a trap. And the ghouls pop up. Right. And you're, so the you're externals were yeah, all yeah, uh, in this right. fantastic place, and they had all gypsies as as extras, and I remember they they liked to be on their own uh, uh, when it, when it was a break. And they only like to be together. You know, they, were, they were very interesting people, fascinating. And then they start singing like that, and they start dancing. And they were at lunchtime, and they did the, and it was just riveting. You know, you couldn't believe this because they're like an ancient people. You know, and they were, uh, they were. It was a vivid memory outside of those walls. You know, to see that. And then the girls, the girls were great, Jane Seymour, who I see here every now and then. You know, and she lived here after that. After that movie, she moved over here. She's an artist and uh, she's, jewelry maker, yes, too, isn't she? Yes, yes. And, and she's, got, um, she's got a couple of lines of um, one's skin. And we, we're always laughing about it, okay? crepey skin. <laughs> Don't get the crepes, she says. <laughs> So you stayed in touch with, with Jeans? Yeah, I see her every now and then, not, not, not often, but, um, and, but she's, uh, she did very well. She got a couple of series, and uh, she got a, a big series called uh, Dr. Quinn, yeah, and, yeah. and that just that put her back in the... Show. Show. Yeah. And of and course, it was Tat Taran Power and yes, well. Yes, yes. Like two, two strong female roles in the film. Right. Yeah. And her mom was Linda Christian, who had been Taran's uh, wife. And she was a wild woman too. You know. And the two of them were characters. But Taryn was a very, very sweet girl, very nice and fun. And Jane and I lived uh, in uh, villas right next to each other. And so, so we'd go to work together. And, the car, and she'd fall asleep on my, my lap. Because I'd known her since Romeo and Juliet. We both, we both auditioned for it together. You know, uh, as if I think I was. 15 and she was 14 or something like that, really, literally. And because Zeffirelli was looking for a very young, because the real Romeo and Juliet were very young. So. And you mentioned Patrick Wayne, who of course yes, was the second Yes, we were really good friends, with. yeah. And uh, that, that ghoul fight that you mentioned, that, yes. that's one of the highlights, the sword fight and everything. Is yeah, I fight with him, that, yeah. it, and that was uh, um, an intricate fight scene. It was, uh, it was quick, but it was... We, we got it down, and he was uh, a lot of fun. I got on very well with him. And once his, uh, I remember um, we were in the hotel, and he, we were returning, I think, at the same time, we were on the same floor, and, and we heard, Patrick, it's your dad. <laughs> and there he was, you know, and he was like, wow. <laughs> That's, uh, what a special moment. Yes! Yeah, so, <laughs> but he was, um, a very nice man, and he he brought his wife and children out there too. And he was a lot of fun. It just seems like everyone was having so much fun during the. That's what was great stories. about the both movies. In different ways, they were just nothing but fun. Because because you somehow uh, every everybody was mostly from the theater, and it was kind of like a break from that that kind of. Uh, there's a kind of snobbery about the theater, you know, and trying to be. In, and um, and this you could let loose and have fun, and it ended up really great stuff on screen. You know, you'd see, you'd see this delightful stuff because they're unique movies. And I think that atmosphere is what they're trying to, what they miss now, and you don't see captured very often. I mean, when you saw the films when they finally came out, and you saw 
all of the magic that Ray had created. After long after you'd finished the live action, he'd go and work away on his own and animate all of the models. How did you feel when you saw the, the finished article? Well, that was that was uh, that was what was amazing. The first one I, I remember seeing in Leicester Square, I think. Uh, I think it was the Odeon Leicester Square, and um, and I was sitting next to some children, and. Uh, and they loved me every time I'd fall over or something I'd do something, something. and they were and he this kid next to me went Daddy's he's so, he's so funny you know? and they had no idea at all until the end <laughs> I told them that's me you know <laughs> that's good to get positive feedback yes the whole yeah. thing you know and I, I was amazed at how all that worked because even even though you know this is a funny scene or this is a then, when you see it, I mean, it's just put together so brilliantly. And then the monsters themselves. And Kali was really terrifying. And that's a great sequence. That's a classic sequence that you see used a lot. You know? and, uh, and, and the whole idea of using... Because that was a very evil god, in, a goddess. And, uh, and they use it properly. And I've seen actual uh, exhibitions here at LACMA of, of real like, um, Kali statues and, and, and to get that detail and to, and to even choose her and I, the idea of having that fight that's what Ray's imagination is all about you know and seeing the swords coming out yeah, yeah. oh that's just brilliant yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes and that look you know and, she, and then the, having a voluptuous figure you know, long before uh, before the big feminine things of the feminine thing fighting you, you know, it's yeah. like pretty amazing. Yeah. And uh, uh, that was really fun. That was a long sequence to shoot. It was very hard to shoot. And I have to throw a, um, a whole uh, part of uh, fire, literally. Yeah, and it was on a wire so that it stops oh, yeah. and looks like it hits Kali. And then, then she chases all of us all over the place. And I end, end up behind her. You know. Was I right in remembering that with the Kali dance scene, that Dad had several actresses come in and do all the... Yes. So they all had to walk together and do all the arm things so that he could get, I think, for you guys, for doing the sword play and everything? Yes. 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 The detail, again, yeah. that's, that's the kind of thing yeah. he would do. You know. And I think those were... the. I think they, we had used the dancing girls in that same sequence with the ghouls, and 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 I, I was showing them a good time, and then showing the, the the dancing girls, and then I think one of the, or two of them they used later on to to do the movement, because that was very important, because she moved in a strange way, in a sinuous kind of way, but it was deadly, you know? and the scimitars and everything yeah. it was great. That was a long sequence. That was John and I would did days on that, one. and then each one of I think a couple of them were killed in that one, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Was, a, that was a deadly sword fight. And again, so complex because there's so many different things going yeah. on. Yeah, and you you were literally losing characters yeah, <laughs> over time, you know, so it seemed very dangerous. And very... So Kali was a highlight from the Golden Voyage of Sinbad. Yes. Was there a specific creature or sequence from Eye of the Tiger that stood out for you? Well, we did that whole... Uh, after the green men, then there's the, the griffin and the... What's the other... Well, in Eye of the Tiger is when you have Minotaur, the baboon... Um, oh, that's right. The, the tiger um, comes after you've been... After your character has, has, been, uh, has killed been... Killed by the baboon. Yeah. By the, which was... The prince had been turned yeah. into a baboon. That's yeah. right. And, uh, and Zerubia transforms and becomes a tiger. Right. And that's uh, Actually, there's a great sequence in on board ship where she's playing chess with the, with the baboon. Mm. Mm. That's a great yeah. sequence, you know. And that, those things were really well written and well thought out. You know? And they, those little touches in between, the, there were many levels to the, to the movie. It wasn't just, just non-stop nonsense. You know? And I have to take it, it's a little different because you've got two friendly characters as well as all the sort of the, the beasts that are battled with. You've got the baboon, yeah. you've got Trog, who are friendly, yes. friendly characters. Yes. There was also a suit built for Trog. Do you remember that? So Trog, like Minotaur, there was going to be a man in a suit playing him for long shots. Do you have any memory of seeing that? It was another suit built by Colin Arthur, and it wow. eventually was unused in the film. It didn't quite match. No, um, that, that I was don't a, remember anything. It was po possibly scrapped quite early on. There's a few pictures of, of that, um, 
just interested to see if that was something that you No, I don't remember or... that. Uh, but I remember being inside the, the pyramid for days on end. Yeah. <laughs> it was huge. It was tiring just to walk up to the top. You know? But it was, um, that, those sequences were great. And you could feel that there was a kind of a majesty to it. You know? And everybody was enjoying that one. And we, they, when I was dead with the broken neck, you know, we're, we were all meticulous about get, getting everything looking right. And, uh, and then she and I had, uh, I was dead, but she had a very emotive scene you know, at that point. And I think we were on that floor for like two days. <laughs> at, the, at that angle, <laughs> two days, <laughs> something like that. It is a nice sequence because she is just she's it's just great. A, she's an assertive mother. You can't. Yes. Yeah, that's that sort of yes, it was really so it's a nice thing to. Yeah, that's what's so great about them. You know, people and the ha- and casting was so brilliant because to get these guy people of, of that caliber, mm-hmm. you know, to be playing even Jane, you know, it was just like she was she was all out. You know, and we were just talking about. Um, about this stunt that they wanted done at the end, where do you remember the ape? Yes. Was wrapped around me, uh-huh. and uh, it bites me, and then I can't kill Jane, Jane Seymour. Uh-huh. And uh, uh, when we came to do that, the stuntman said he didn't want to do it, which was fall down all the way down the pyramid. Yeah. And me being being a youngster and all and and fit and doing martial arts and everything. I said, no, it's okay, I'll do it myself. (laughs) And they said, really? So they patted me up a Uh little bit. And then he came to do it. And I I don't know what happened because I woke up at the bottom. Oh, oh my God. But it was fine. I was fine. Because your head was at a weird angle and everything. It looked like so well. Yes, yes. But it wasn't broken. No, obviously, I'm glad you're here. (laughs) But it sure felt like it for for a few minutes. (laughs) But that the the sound man actually just left. He was he was a fly by night guy that just just wouldn't do it. So So we did all these fight scenes, Uh you know, which were hectic. By all the gods of the underworld, there must be. It's true what you say, Connor, that um, he has a, a really crisp memory of, of, of the film. So you know, when we like something, we, we try and retain those memories. And, you know, Kurt's done a great job in in basically reenacting for us what it must have been like to be on set and to be around that whole creative process. And, of course, he even recognised then that Ray Harryhausen was sort of unique in his field. There was nobody else really doing it at this level um, on major A pictures from studios. That's right. And Kurt, I suppose, represents that generation of Ray Harryhausen fans who had grown up with uh, with the earlier classics so he he had he had grown up as a, as a child watching Jason and the Argonauts and actually um just just after we finished recording he mentioned that he'd starred as a child in a film with John Kearney who of course uh, was Hylas in Jason and the Argonauts so he's somebody we've interviewed before for our podcast it's it's a small world really these two actors that that had encountered each other in a, in a separate film but but the point is that Kurt had grown up watching the early Sinbad film and Jason and the Argonauts and now he was starring in two Ray Harryhausen classics so he he was uh, somebody who was well aware of the wonderful effects that were about to be created on screen and i suppose that added to the appeal and part of the magic for him Yes, and you know, I suppose we would uh, we would call Curse a fanboy these days. You know, someone who's very um, much in touch with what's happening and very excited about who he's working with. And I, I was really pleased because I didn't know you were going to ask him about the the whole area of scenes which were planned 
creatures that were planned and, uh, and didn't make it. And so you asked him about the lost film, something we talked a lot here about on the Ray Harryhausen podcast. And he gave you some interesting and frank replies. Ho there, Captain of the Watch. Open the gate. Captain! Wake, 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 wake! It's Sinbad, friend of the Caliph Qasim! And a better friend to the Princess Farah! <laughs> Captain Sinbad! You know me? I am a merchant. I hope to purchase some of the cargo you will unload tomorrow. Ah. No one is to be admitted to Charak after sunset. But why? The plague. Many have died. Every time we reach this port, some misfortune strikes us. The plague. The Caliph Qasim and his sister, Princess Farah. They are well, but Qasim is not the Caliph. Not as yet. I was told in Jiraj that the Caliph Qasim's father died three months ago. True, but Qasim has not yet been crowned. Captain, we'd better return to the ship. Yes, best to leave and sell our cargo elsewhere. I'm not leaving Chirac until I see Princess Farah and Kasim. But, Captain, it is the plague. Is there another way into the town? No. But if you wish to take the risk, you may enter at daybreak when the curfew is lifted. Until then, I can only offer to relieve your disappointment. My tent has wine, food, and music. My people are your servants. Please, be welcome. Come. Now, I have to ask, one of the things that we're working on just now at the Foundation is researching all of the, the lost films that Ray had potentially, was maybe going to work on and which never came out with the ideas that he had that, that never quite made it to the big screen. Because the Sinbad films that you starred in were so successful, they made a lot of money, they, were, they, weren't, they didn't cost a lot to make and they made a, they were mm. a huge success at the mm. box office. Um, the studio really wanted Ray to make a third Sin, or a fourth Sinbad film in the oh. 1970s um, and this was going to be entitled Sinbad Goes to Mars. Did you know anything <laughs> about this? <laughs> I you wish I had. <laughs> It does raise a smile, and it no, really said yes. that whenever people hear about this project, they tend to smile or laugh. And but knowing uh, him, that's probably like way ahead of time. You know, that's like he was thinking thinking about a movie now. You know, that would be made. That you could get that made easily now. Well, <laughs> I would wonder if that is something because because you've been in two Simba films. Well, they wanted to, maybe you were the good luck charm. Maybe <laughs> back for I, I, wish, film. that would have been lovely. But I did talk to him, um, <laughs> to both of you actually. Um, about other, because I was interested in Greek myths, uh-huh. and then he always mixed all the myths up, which was great, you know, and, and even, and Jason and the Argonauts had been one of my favorite movies as a kid, you know, and, um, and so the Greek myths, I was wondering what was going to be next, you know, mm-hmm. where you could, what you could do, and I was coming up with all kinds of uh-huh. ideas as well, you know, because it, because they're so great, you know, you can do so much with them. But that, to me, something you've just said is very interesting because you are an actor that grew up and had seen Ray's films. So yes. you knew all about him by the time yes. that this sort of second half of Ray's career, right. whereas he was, a, you know, he was becoming a well known name and the, the person that you'd go to for special effects. So you grew up and you'd seen Jason and you'd seen the earlier films. Yes, before. and then that name was so vivid. Because you knew it was a Harryhausen movie, it was a Ray Harryhausen movie. It wasn't, you didn't think of Charles or any of the directors or anything like that. It was all about, about him, his name, and, and it was a legendary thing that you looked for. You know. And I'd seen at least three movies of his, I think. And, uh, and, and the, uh, Jason the Argonauts had a really strong effect on me, because I, I, I loved the, that story. And it was super well done as well. And then I was, I, I liked the way that he blended all the different things, because the, the, the idea of Sinbad, who's from the Scheherazade and the, and the Thousand and One Nights, you know, mixing up with, with all these griffins and yeah. odd things from different... Well, he had, to, he had to take quite complex mythology yes. and then process it for a 90-minute movie, which was going to be entertaining as right. well as being, you know, right. there's an educational aspect to it as well. But Absolutely. Yet to appeal to audiences and to young people. So what he was doing was actually incredibly clever and incredibly uh, it clever. had such a huge influence on in future generations of, of filmmakers. And of oh, films. my. He had literally these, these uh, young guys, apparently, Guillermo told me that, when they did a, a um, was it? Did he do um, those conventions? Was he ever? At Rin- yeah, he went to lots of Yes, to and then yeah. he said it was like uh, they were like groupies. Well, this brings us on to the legacy. Because I'm not sure if you're aware of the work that we do at the foundation, but Ray kept everything, all of the models from all of the films. So all the films you started, we still have Minotaur, we still have Cali, and they were so. Who made those? No, Ray made, Ray made them all. He made them all oh himself. God. I mean, Ray would start, sketch the idea, then build a mold and a prototype, then sculpt the model, then animate it himself, and then he'd be on set with, with you all. Um, 
overseeing things. So he really was a one-man industry. Yes. And uh, it's interesting to... to, to well, that was one of those genius things where, where because you want somebody to be in complete control like that because he, he had all these ideas. Can you... I don't know when he worked with the script writer as well. He co they were co-scripted, weren't they? Um, well, Ray would tend to pitch drawings, like yeah. set pieces, and come up with a rough screenplay, and then that would go to the screenwriters, and they would incorporate Ray's drawings. Like, okay, we need a, you know, we didn't need a battle with Kelly, for example. Yes. The script would work around that. Yeah. So the set pieces were there from Ray's imagination. Yeah, that's, that's what I, I, I had a feeling that the, that the ideas were so strong. You know, then you'd you'd come up, you'd have to have these three, five characters or seven different monsters or. Or uh, uh, characters, and and uh, and that would be the way it would be written. You know, that's and so interesting. Did you ever meet Ray later in life? Because you obviously spent a lot of time with Ray and his work in the nineteen seventies. Did you ever encounter him again? Um, no, but it, but it was close because when he was doing these kind of um, these conventions and things, and then then coincidentally meeting Guillermo, uh, who who actually Ron, my friend, who I train. He, he met him as a makeup artist. Guillermo was a makeup artist who worshipped Ray Harryhausen, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, so I almost went a few times. It was a close thing, and, and but it didn't pan out, unfortunately, because mm -hmm. I really, uh, for, for considering I spent the way that I spent time with him, I can't say that I was a, cl a close friend of his, but it felt like it. Yeah. You know. It was one of those things where you, you always feel completely comfortable with that person the rest of your life. Like your mom, I'm sure, mm -hmm. would be the same. You know? Right, Because uh, uh, not only a shared experience, but just, just he was one of those benign people that make life better uh -huh. you know, for everybody. Such a nice thing to say. That's such a nice, uh, nice memories. And we're talking a lot about about your work in the nineteen seventies. But I'm sure a lot of fans of, of Ray's films will one want to know a little bit about what you're doing now and uh, about about your life today and in two thousand and eight. Yeah, I moved to uh, not long after that. I moved. Uh, my parents were here, and my my uh, younger sister, and uh, I moved over here with with a girlfriend and. Uh, and started and went up for different movies and shows and and it was just at the time when they were making it like if I was going to play a Mexican uh, gang guy or something like that uh, they wanted the real person to do it not just it had to be somebody that was ethnically that and then they, and they said and and so things started to dry up a little bit because I always looked a little exotic or odd or different and um, and then it just wasn't enough action for me, unfortunately. Uh, I should have hung in there. And my I got married, and my wife did not like show business <laughs> at all. <laughs> she thought it was just a, a place to meet girls, you know. <laughs> Basically, she was very jealous, and uh -huh. she uh, so she so that was like four years or five years went by, and then and then I, I did a couple of series and. Uh, that were a lot of fun, but it was so sporadic that it ended up being. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I had to work. I wanted to work, mm -hmm. and do stuff. Because <laughs> many a time I asked Dad, "Oh, have you heard about what's, what's Kurt Cobain doing?" Uh, oh, I don't know. He's just disappeared. So, <laughs> okay. but uh, yeah, you were thought about a lot. Oh, that's sweet. That's really great. That's really great. This is so great. Oh, <laughs> but no, I wanted to. I know you had said he would bring the models to the set. Yes. And when so when, when you were talking about the eye line that you yes. had that he had uh, given you, did he did he show you just the models? Did he show you um, drawings, or did he describe the monsters? Like, I mean, oh. obviously they weren't there really. <laughs> no. So the, the the cutout was just to, for an eye line, and and then they would move that cutout into different oh, okay. different parts of the. There, she's coming from here, and she's eight foot tall, and she's, and and uh, and then he would show you on the model some of, some of her movement, and um, and then he would describe it all, and okay. go into, and then you're going to run here, and you're you know, you're going to cross over like this, and you're, gonna, but it was um, very very informative, and it was exactly what you needed because they were 
pretty intricate choreography mm -hmm. because of everything being the stop motion added later, you know, everything had to be just right. And they did uh, these mats in the camera, in the camera mm -hmm. stuff. You know, they, when you looked through that camera, it was unbelievable. You couldn't believe it. The, all these palaces and things were there built into the rock or, you know. Oh, yeah, so it was phenomenal. And he was very meticulous about all these details, but it never was boring or, or it was always interest fascinating. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and he's, he was so enthusiastic himself. That was another thing. I that that, yeah. that even even some of the most sophisticated actors and actresses who were like you know I don't know why I'm, I'm, you know, I've got to do this movie but uh, you know I, I can't wait to get back to the theater you know. they would get carried away with it and they, then they'd give their hundred percent in the scene you know. <laughs> Yeah, Caroline said she had seen many drawings that he used to bring That's up true, set. too. That's true. And that they would just be... I mean, I've seen and when we'd have script dance. readings, you know, so, um, sometimes uh, oh, they, he'd yeah, have all the drawings yeah. there, too. When we had table reads. And, mm -hmm. and, and they were the storyboards. That yes. Were, yeah, the little storyboards that he so you could see each scene and what he had to do. Yes, yeah. yes. Did he paint those and draw them? He did all the sketches and everything. I remember going up to his studio up in, in London... And he'd be on his on his um, easel, and he'd be preparing them all ready for everybody to. Because he said you guys had to know what yes. you were doing and get an imagination. You can't, you know. I think that's why they did the big cutouts. Yes. So that you had that because how can you give all of that emotion to right. something that you can't see and you don't know? If that's it's, right. You know, you've got to have. And all of us would have been looking at different. Different places. Yeah. I mean, we wouldn't yeah. have been have it right. We wouldn't all be looking exactly the same place, and which is yeah. what we had to do. And uh, boy, it was so interesting that you you really got carried away in those big big mm -hmm. scenes, and you really felt like you were fighting something. And then you kind of woke up and thought, "What the hell am I doing? <laughs> There's nothing there." Why do you think it is that the race so celebrated? You know, more than thirty five years after after his final film, and people still and are encountering these films for the first time and being inspired by them? You know, I think there's an emotional content that's, that's I find missing from a lot of CGI and a lot of... A lot, that's just... And even the physical weight of some of the things like Incredible Hulk, it never feels right to me, quite right. And though stop motion is an, a much older technology and, and there's something... I think it's to do with the writing and the, the imagination... You know that, uh, and the characters so well thought out the, the his characters that um, that I think you get you get drawn into them and they're very very interesting, you know. And um, uh, that's that kind of thing you just don't see in the same way anymore. And then to see how uh, it's kind of like reading a Jules Verne novel. You know, it's like unbelievable that he thought of these things, the submarines and all the rest of it at, at that point, you know. And now we would do the submarine so smoothly and we'd be every d detail of it, but it still wouldn't have the impact that the first one had, you know. And I think, uh, I think that, and then him, as a man, that to have a, a, a genius, literally, that you can communicate with, that loved communicating with you and with people and, and enjoyed people, you know, that's a rare thing. Usually, they're 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 introverted or they're they're angry or difficult people. You know, but but he was just you know like, like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I think that makes uh -huh. makes a huge difference uh, as well. And the blending of all of those things, and then having a body of work like that. And I think another thing is the cast. The way they cast the movies it was very very smart and very. And really good to have really, really good actors playing all the parts. Well, you were certainly a part of that as well. And I would like to thank you so much for your time today. Lovely, it's really it was nice lovely. To... Will you take me on as a fully fledged seaman now? Iowa. And make yourself fast with that rope. Don't worry. I always trust in Allah. Oh! <laughs> but tie I up your camel. <laughs> 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 There you go, his memories um, on, on that side of things. You know, he wasn't fully aware, was he, Connor, of the trog sequence that was 
tried and, and quickly discarded. No, I think it's interesting for us because we're so immersed in, in all the different aspects of race films. It's interesting to get the perspective of somebody who was, who was there on set and who was uh, getting to know his, his fellow actors and actresses, learning lines and, and looking into what Ray was going to be doing next. But yeah, maybe not being quite as aware of, of the, uh, the wider events which were occurring costumes that, which were discarded and, and the trog sequence that uh, it was something that uh, that I was quite interested to, to get his opinion on because he was so complimentary about Colin Arthur and about the the, uh, the wonderful Minotaur outfit and the work that Colin Arthur had carried out and you heard a story there about the fangs that Colin created for him so I, I wanted I wanted to know a little more about his knowledge of, of things that maybe didn't end up in the final film Happy memories from Kurt there, and uh, it it was interesting because he was in two of Ray's films in a row. He's in some esteemed company there because uh, several actors were were the stars of multiple Ray Harryhausen pictures. But uh, you know, there you've got Patrick Troughton, who who was the the second Doctor in Doctor Who. Got uh, Lawrence Naismith, who was in Jason and the Argonauts and The Valley of Guanji, and of course Kerwin Matthews, who was the star of the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad and the Three Worlds of Gulliver. So some quite big names there, some quite esteemed company, and Kurt is another one who, I, I suppose, Charles Sneer and, and Ray Harryhausen decided that he was the right man for the job uh, in two films running. Yes, I mean, that, that's unusual. You know, you cast actors because they're good, but also because they give you no trouble. Um, producers note that. Um, <laughs> and so the Lost Films book is now available to pre-order on Amazon, both here in the UK and in the United States via Amazon.com. And you can find out much more about the films Ray didn't make, but also from the films Ray did make, such as The Golden Voyage of Sinbad and Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. Details of the sequences that were cancelled and that were scrapped for either economic or technical reasons, and the story behind how Eye of the Tiger was put together. A um, bit of a Frankenstein's monster of creatures and sequences from, from something else. So that's that's fully available, and myself and Connor will be We'll be touring with the book fairly soon, so you'll be able to ask us many more questions about it. So that's going to be an exciting uh, year ahead, isn't it, Connor? Yes, absolutely, and I think that um, fans may know some of this, uh, some of these films which never made it to the big screen, and some of these sequences which were never filmed. But actually, there there is so much. You know, the research over the last year, the amount of information which we uncovered in our archive and uh, in the collections of of our friends worldwide um you know it, it's astounding and i think uh, this is definitely going to be a, a must a must order book it's ready for pre-order now and there's going to be some fantastic information and imagery contained within now talking of books that you must have last year's harry house and the movie posters book has been nominated for an award at the rondo awards and it's one of three that um that we've been nominated for connor isn't it that's right as well as harry housen the movie posters by richard hollis which is in the best book category, we have the the appearance we've just spoken about, the the induction of Ray Harryhausen into the Visual Effects Society's Hall of Fame that has been nominated for Best Event. And our podcast, this this podcast that we're speaking on right now, is uh, is, um, in the Best Media category. So if you like the Ray Harryhausen podcast, if you listen to John and I discussing... Uh, Ray Harryhausen's legacy and you like to hear all of the commentary recordings and the interviews that we bring to you then then please uh, consider us for a vote if you'd like to vote for the Ray Harryhausen podcast or Harryhausen the movie posters or Ray Harryhausen's induction into the VES Hall of Fame then you can head to rondoaward.com and it's quite a quite a simple process for submitting uh, your your choices you just email the the awards organizer David Colton and his email address is taraco at aol.com. So that's T-A-R-A-C-O at aol.com. And uh, submissions are to be entered by Sunday the 20th of April. So you have a few weeks to do that. And yes, wonderful, because a lot of hard work has gone into into Richard's poster book, as well as our podcast and everything else that we do. And it, it would be really lovely to, uh, to, to have Ray's ongoing legacy recognised. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, uh, you know, vote for all three categories if you if you wish. And it's lovely to have a presence at the Rondo Awards. And we hope that um, it's, it's something we'll be doing regularly, maybe next year for the uh, for the Lost Films book as well. Plenty to get your teeth into there with the Rondo Awards. And have we got anything else coming up this year, Colin? Well, yes, we do. Now, we are going to have uh, a lot of 
large announcements uh, this this coming summer because we're preparing, we're working very hard on our centenary celebrations for Ray Harryhausen's 100th birthday in 2020. And I've mentioned on the podcast before, we're going to have a huge exhibition in Edinburgh in the summer of 2020 at the National Galleries of Scotland. So we're counting down, we're working hard on that. A lot of behind the scenes work going on just now uh, to prepare for that. So the best thing to, for you to do is to, to keep an eye on our, our Facebook and our Twitter accounts. But we also now have a, a monthly newsletter, um, which is which is the Ray Harryhausen newsletter. And if you sign up for that, you'll get kept up to date on, on all of our different projects, on, on John's Lost Movies book, on our exhibition plans, and plans for events around the world. It won't just be in the UK. We're, we're always keen to make sure we... We, we we see raise American fans too and then let them find out a little bit more about what the foundation is working on. And also we're now on Instagram as well. So we're being um, we're being devoured by the uh, the social media networks, aren't we, Connor? That's right. The uh, Instagram account is uh, ray.harryhausen, so very easy to remember. And that'll be a, a great way for you to see some behind-the-scenes images from the archive, images of Ray's models, of Ray's artwork, and, some of, again, some of the projects that we're working on. Um, Instagram's a lot of fun, and it's, it's always great to, to share and to, to see the uh, images that people, people tag us in because t- people tag their, uh, their, their movie collections or their book collections or all, all sorts of different things, uh, Harryhausen-related, and it's always lovely to see us being tagged in those as well and people's personal collections and their memories of Ray's films. Now, if you've been inspired by listening to Kurt Christian and his uh, reminiscences of The Golden Voyage of Sinbad and Sinbad and The Eye of the Tiger, both films have been beautifully restored by Sony Home Video and they're available now as high-definition Blu-rays and also as downloads. So if you want to trot along to where you get your DVDs and downloads and download the HD versions, you can find them with lots of glorious extras as well. And they've done a marvellous restoration job um, with crystal clear picture and stereo sound for both films, something that uh, they didn't have completely. Certainly the uh, Golden Voyage of Sinbad didn't have for its theatrical run. So looking and sounding better than they've ever done. Thanks very much, uh, Sony Home Video. Yes, and a huge thank you to to Kurt Christian for for being so generous with his time. We had a really lovely afternoon, and as you'll have heard from the interview, there were lots of laughs, lots of happy memories. It was great to be there with uh, with Vanessa and Tammy as well, because they were they were both just young girls when these films were being made, so they have their own perspective on things. But uh, it was a really lovely atmosphere, and again, as I mentioned before, a testament to, to just how beloved these films are some, some 45 years on. That's marvellous. Well, thanks very much, Connor. It's been great listening to your interview, and uh, I'm going to trundle off now and uh, and listen myself to uh, to both films and uh, and watch them as well. And uh, it was great to hear his memories on Sinbad Goes to Mars. It raised a chuckle there, but um, I must say, as as a as a slight PS afterthought, um, people did chuckle at the time, didn't they, about Sinbad Goes to Mars? But the plot for Sinbad Goes to Mars, which is in the Lost Films book and some of the artwork that's never been seen quite reminiscent of a very successful film from the 1990s, Stargate. So a bit of a thought there to leave uh, listeners with, Connie, yes? Yes, that's right. This uh, Stargate was an- another one of my childhood films, something I saw in the, in the cinema. You know, the visual effects in that movie blew me away. If you think that Sinbad Goes to Mars sounds like a perhaps a, an unpalatable idea, just just think of the plot of, of Stargate. It wasn't a million miles away, and it was, a, you know, certainly a classic movie of the 1990s. So that's that's a good final thought. Well, thanks, everybody, for, for listening. Thank you for listening to episode 25 of the Ray Harryhausen podcast, and look out for episode 26 coming in the spring. Thanks very much. Copyright in the Ray Harryhausen podcast is owned by the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation, a registered Scottish charity, number SC001419, 2019. This recording may not be reproduced in whole or in part without written permission from the Foundation. The views expressed within these podcasts do not necessarily reflect those of the Foundation, its trustees or employees. For further terms and conditions, please contact us at rayharryhausen.com where you can find our Facebook, Twitter and Instagram links.